But today we are at the end of the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 21 through 24. These four verses stand as Paul's final greeting to the church, his final words. It's benediction, it's prayer. You know, you come, I don't know if you're like me, but you can come to an end of a book like this, and I'm already looking to Jonah and transcendence of God, and so I can look and think, oh, well, what's really here in these ending words? You know, it can seem like these might just be like throwaway words. But you know that sometimes when people write their last words, these are the most important words. These are the words that are going to be ringing in the ears of the Ephesians as the letter concludes. The last thing that you want to put in someone's mind is, is, is the things that are the most important to you. It's why you get all that junk email and those, those junk flyers and have to, you know, asking you for money to contribute to something. And at the very end, it says, P.S., won't you consider giving $10 today? And you think, well, you've asked me that 15 times. But they want the last thing for you to see is, will you, will you give And that's what this is. This is Paul's last words. It's a goodbye. But it's a gospel goodbye. He's been preaching the gospel and teaching about the gospel and the implications of the gospel. Christ's perfect life, death, resurrection, ascension, his return, and all the implications that that means for the church. And he's coming to the end and he's writing these words because he wants the church in Ephesus Ephesus to flourish. The church was designed to flourish in the gospel. And that's what Paul wants for his readers in the book of Ephesians. And you know what? I feel the same way for you. I'm not saying any goodbyes, but, but I am feeling the same way for you. I want you, Grace Church, to flourish in the gospel. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of a church that is flourishing in the knowledge and the truth and the, the life that the Spirit gives us in the gospel. So we read these words with those thoughts in mind as we see how the church is meant to flourish. So read with me. Verse 21, Paul writes, So that you also may know how I am doing, how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Let's pray. Father, we take a moment away from our iPads and our iPhones and the material distractions of the world, we take a moment to turn our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to you. Lord, I want you to meet us in this moment. I want you to cause our hearts to to thrive and flourish in what you've done. Lord, in a room this big, I know that many come in discouraged, downcast, um, dull, bored, unaware of you, unbelieving, Lord, you have so much work you want to do today in us. Would you help us to be responsive to you? And may the preaching of your word cause the intended effect that you desire it to have. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Sometimes the scriptures come at us really strong. And there's exhortations of things we ought to do and things we ought to avoid. And we've been reading a lot of those exhortations in the book of Ephesians. As Paul turned into chapter 4, you see in chapter 4 and 5 and 6, there is exhortations heaped upon exhortations for the way that the church ought to live out the truth of the gospel. And then there are some passages that you say, well, I don't know, really know that this really speaks to me. I mean, he's talking about Tychicus and the church, and, and how does this speak to us as a church? Well, God's word speaks to us sometimes very directly, but, but always speaks to us through the lens of redemption and the lens of the building of the church, the lens of Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so I've got two points that come implicitly from this text this morning that I think will encourage us in walking out what God wants us to walk out as a church. And here's what they are. The first is that the church is where relationships are meant to flourish. If the church is the place where the gospel is to flourish, then in a particular way, the church is where relationships ought to flourish. And we see this as Paul writes these last words. 
You know, he didn't have to write this section. He could have just said, signing off, Paul. You know, he, he gives us a window into his heart as we come to verse 21. The one thing that's clear about Paul, as you read through the, the letter of Ephesians, is that Paul is a master theologian. He is a master theologian. He is writing theology that just blows your mind, this, this, this idea of God coming to earth to bring redemption to sinners through his son, Jesus Christ, raising him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit so that he might seat Christ in the heavenly places and he might seat us with Christ in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show off the riches of his immeasurable grace. He does this by grace, through faith, not as a, a work that we do. So that no one may boast, he has prepared for us good works in Jesus Christ. He has joined together Jews and Gentiles, uniting this church of diverse people together in one new man. Paul is preaching the the truth of the depth of the gospel. That's why he prays, oh, that we might know the riches and the depth and the breadth and the height of your love. He is a master theologian. But we come to the end of the book and we see that Paul is deeply a pastor, Not just a theologian, but he is a pastor. He cares deeply about this church. Now, if you were here on January 13th, I'm sure you remember everything that we said about why Paul was writing this letter. But in case you weren't, I'll remind you. We traced the relationship of Paul to this church back in the beginning. Paul had stopped off at Ephesus on his way back from Antioch on his second missionary journey. You can read about this, by the way, in Acts 18 and then 19 and 20. This is the the story of him interacting with Ephesus. He comes through on his second missionary journey. He stops off. He drops off Priscilla and Aquila. He, He moves on, but he comes back shortly thereafter, and he begins to teach and disciple. He begins to build this church. He does his normal pattern. He starts first in the synagogue. And then after they kick him out of there, he begins to teach in the heat of the afternoon to anyone who would listen to him preach the good news of Jesus Christ. That's in Acts 19. And Paul stays in the city of Ephesus from the fall of A.D. 52 to the spring of A.D. 56. So almost three and a half years. He's in the city. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's discipling as God builds this church. And then he moves on, continues his missionary journey. We read in Acts 20 that he comes back to Ephesus about a year later. He's on his way to Jerusalem from Corinth to visit. And he he stops off and he visits with the Ephesian elders. And you look in Acts 20. Actually, if you can flip over to Acts 20. Just a little ways over to the left-hand side. Go to Acts 20. I want to read this together because this gives us the heart, a picture of the heart of Paul as he's writing this letter about the church. So we're in verse 17, 20 verse 17. So Luke captures this. He says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, I'm going to read this whole speech that he gives. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. I'll pause for a second. He's telling them he's he's never coming back and he's going to be hurt. How would you feel, someone you loved and cared about, someone who poured into your life and discipled you and, and taught you and cared for you, gives you this news? Verse 24, he says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. 
Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You hear even language of this letter to the church he's going to write later on. I coveted no one's silver or, or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Most sorrowful by the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. After all that he says, all of his admonitions, all of his warnings, what impacts him the most is, we're not going to see you again, Paul. And that hurts. That's hard. They are, I, I, I don't know these men personally, but these are grown men who are weeping and kissing Paul out of their sorrow. They take him to the ship. Paul sets sail for Rome. He's eventually put under house arrest. He's awaiting his trial in Rome, and it's likely in this setting, r roughly A.D. 61 to 62, four, four to five years later, that he writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. He sends a letter back four to five years later. Paul is a master theologian, but he is deeply a pastor. He loves this church. He knows their love for him. I bet as he's writing this letter to the church and as he's coming to the end, I bet he can feel the, the, the wetness of their tears and their kisses on his neck still as he's penning this letter and their sorrow over his going. And he wants them to know how he's doing because the church is where relationships are meant to flourish in the gospel. So yes, he teaches them about the gospel. He's teaching them about treasuring Christ and living for Christ and proclaiming Christ, but he also wants to share himself. And so he sends his friend Tychicus. Verse 21. So that you will know how I am and how I am do what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. So who is Tychicus? Who is this guy? Well, Tychicus is one of his close friends. We, 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 he pops up in all these different letters. He's in Colossians, he's in 2 Timothy, he's in Titus. He's named, he's named with another man from Ephesus. Uh, and so they likely think that Tychicus was from Ephesus and maybe became Paul's friend while he was ministering there. And then when he left, Tychicus joined him in his mission. He, Tychicus is the uh, courier of this letter. He also is the courier of Colossians and likely the courier of Philemon as well. We see Paul sending him to Crete in, in Timothy, second, or in Titus, to be, with, to be with Titus. And we see him in 2 Timothy going back to Ephesus again. If you can reach way back to when we talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when Paul was taking up this offering from the Corinthian church, and he had brothers who were accompanying him on that journey, it's likely that Tychicus was one of those brothers as well. So he is a faithful co-laborer in Christ. But Paul wants us to know something else. He tells us that Tychicus is the beloved brother, the beloved brother, the one who is close to his heart. So here's the picture. Got all the history now, right? Here's the picture. Paul in prison, in chains, 
writing letters to encourage the church, sends someone whom he loves and someone who knows the church in Ephesus to deliver his, his letter, his message, and his, his heart to the people in the city. So Tychicus takes his ship and makes its way back to Ephesus and, and arrives and shares with them not only the, the letter of Ephesians, which would have been awesome to be there and to hear this letter read out loud in the church, but also says, hey, this is what ha- is happening with Paul. This is how he's doing. And more importantly, this is how God is using Paul in his chains. The church, by definition, is relational. It's not enough for him to send a letter. He sends a letter with a beloved brother because the church is relational. He wants him to be encouraged with what's happening in his life. It's, it's not sufficient for him to fire off a blast email and just you know, spam the churches and say, hey, this is what's happening in my life. No, obviously that wouldn't be possible at that time. But more than that, he wants them to encourage them with where he's at and what God is doing in his life. The church today is relational. It is not simply a, a series of programs that can be accomplished just as well or better by machines. You know, we get the Bible study machine running. We get the prayer machine running. We get the worship machine running. We don't really need human beings The church is relational. It is made of flesh and blood. It is not, the church is not just simply a historic collections of online sermons. You know, so some people, you know, they're not connected to a church because they've got Pastor Piper and Pastor MacArthur and Pastor Driscoll and whoever they listen to online, and that's their pastor and that's their church. No, it's not. Good sermons. But the church is flesh and blood. It is relational. It is incarnational. It is present. It is physical. The church is the place where people who are are struggling together in their own sin to understand the glory of the gospel of grace, they do battle together. They do life together. They worship the Savior together. They cry together. They celebrate together. Side by side, locked arms for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. The church is relational and the church is incarnational. And if you think about it, that is exactly how Jesus, the Son of God, came. You know, God didn't just put a a cloud in the sky to tell us the gospel. He didn't have a banner hanging off of an airplane like you see when you're at the beach and they're trying to advertise to you. He incarnated He took on flesh and blood and walked our earth and experienced our temptations and he suffered and he was tempted as a man. He was suffering as a man. He drank wine and celebrated with his friends at a wedding as a man. He wept for his friend Lazarus as a man. Jesus Christ, this divine son of God, became flesh and blood like us in our humanity and incarnated. Isn't that how it ought to be for us in the church? Isn't that how it ought to be? That the church that where the gospel is meant to flourish is a church where the relationships are flourishing because we are incarnational with each other, meaning we are present with each other. We walk through life together. We walk through babies being born together and adoptions taking place in our body, and new jobs, and baptisms, and weddings, and anniversaries, all of these milestones within our body, we celebrate these things together. And then we hold each other's hands, and we cry with each other when we lose jobs, and when we get into car accidents, and when we are diagnosed with cancer, and when we lose those we love to death, we We hold hands and we do not let go because we are the church where relationships are meant to flourish because of the gospel which has bound us together as one new man. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep and we whisper our grief and we remind each other that Christ is all. He is sufficient in the highs and in the lows, in the greatest joys, in the deepest cries. Christ is everything that we need. God's provision for us, which is the glory of the church. It's why we must be together 
in a church. Why? It's why we must join together in a church. You know, this message, this passage came for me at, at a good time because I was gone last week, and not just from you on Sunday, but I was actually gone. I went to Orlando, and I don't know about you, but whenever I travel, especially when I travel by myself, it doesn't take me more than 15 minutes to get on the plane, and I'm already missing home. I'm missing Tara. I'm texting her. I miss you already. I'm on the plane. We haven't even left yet. I miss my kids. I miss you. I miss the church. It's not because I'm the pastor and, you know, I'm obligated to feel this way about you. Like, I, I should check up on you once in a while. And, you know, it's not like that. I remember over the summer, if you remember, Steve Shank gave me a hard time over the summer because I was listening into live stream uh, when I was on vacation. Now, just as an aside, all my kids were swimming in the pool and I was just sitting there by myself, okay? So just as an, as an aside... But he, he, he and I interacted. He said, I thought you were checking up to make sure everybody was doing their jobs right. I was like, no. You know, I'm sitting there poolside. My kids are swimming and playing with all these other kids' friends that they've met. I'm sitting there by myself. Tara's up in the room making dinner, and Lexi's taking a nap. And I'm thinking, I can listen to Grace Church. I can see you on the live stream. It's not quite incarnational ministry, but, but it's, it's close enough for me at that moment. And so I, I love the church. It's not an obligation to love you. And that's what happened last week. I went away, and I was already looking to come back. And I was mad at myself that I scheduled Rich to preach. <laughs> because I wanted to come home, and I wanted to hear how you were doing, and I wanted to hear how, I wanted to tell you how I'm doing and how the, the, the conference went. Of course, we get to see that our partnership in the gospel is bigger than even this local church. As Rich came and, and preached a word on meekness, how'd you like that? <laughs> Well, I don't know if you were ready for that. I heard from a number of people, I wasn't ready for that, for that message. And I got a chance to go back to the Gilbert Church and preach uh, in, the, in the body of believers that originally commissioned us to come do this work and to encourage them, just like Tychicus is going and bringing a report. I got to bring a report of you and how you're doing and how the church is doing, and it was awesome. So thank you, thank you church, for welcoming Rich and for responding to the word last week. The church is the place where relationships are meant to flourish, now, that's the ideal, right? That's the, that's the ideal. Relationships are all in process. And some relationships come quick, and you know, you meet that person, and they're, you start talking, and you're like best friends almost overnight. And other relationships take a slow amount of time, long amounts of time of just regular contact. So there, there's no magic formula for how to get the kind of relationships that maybe you want in the body. If you're new to Grace Church, or really if you're new to any church at any point, you're new. There's just no way around that. You can't speed up the process. There is no magic formula that you can do. You have got to press into the newness of it. And we, just for those, for those of you who are new guests today or newer to Grace, we want you to do that. We want you to press in to relationship with us. We want to share life with you. We want to build gospel-binding friendships over time with you. But relationships is a lot like cooking a really good stew. It just takes time and checking the ingredients and making sure that everything is kind of happening. And over time, it becomes wonderful. So here are the ingredients. The ingredients are you have to share a hunger for the gospel. Paul, Tychicus, and the church are all reporting on the gospel to share a hunger for the gospel. This, this is a church built on Jesus Christ. So to, to have the kind of relationships you want here, it has to be around the gospel. Second, you have to share life together with a mutual commitment to each other. You know, if you come into the church and out of the church and into the church and out of the church and nobody really knows if you're here or if you're not here, it's really hard to go deep. There's a sense of commitment that we make to one another relationally. We can confess our sins to each other or share our lives with each other without judgment. And third, we need to do this consistently over time. Amen. Over time. I was, I was saying to somebody this week, you know, the, the people that I've known the longest are the people that I've had the most fights with and the people I've shared the most joy with. So Tara is at the top of that list. Um, but my friendships, the ones that I, of you that I know the longest, you're the ones that I probably we've had the most disagreements with over time because we've had a lot of time together. 
but you're also the ones that I know the best and the ones that I love and the ones that I, I, I've cherished your friendship over all of these years. And I think that's a, a reason for us to, to remember why it's important for us to join together. It's this, this is an unashamed plug for what we call membership at Grace Church. Membership is not a biblical word in the sense that you, you read, oh, become a member. But the heart of what a membership is is that we we share hunger for the gospel, we commit to one another relationally, and we do it consistently over a long period of time so that relationships can flourish. One of the discouraging things is when I, as a pastor is when I hear that this isn't happening. You know, from time to time I'll hear from one of you, I don't feel connected. I don't feel like relationships are happening. Now, it may be a product of newness. It may be a product of more time. Um, it may not be any of those things. It may just be God and his sovereignty has allowed you to be in a place where you haven't connected relationally yet as deep as you want. You know, maybe you think you don't fit in because you know, there's not the same demographic at a small church you know, that, that fits you perfectly. Well, I would say that this is a, not a cultural problem first. This is a theological problem first, that with God's help, we must avoid. We don't form ourselves as a church to have relationships flourish around anything less than what God wants it to be, which is Jesus Christ. And what, what happens is when we form our identities and our relationships around things other than Jesus Christ, secondary to him, lesser than him, cliques start to form, right? Cliques form when we find our identity in something less than Christ, and we welcome people that, listen, it's not wrong to have hobbies and things you love and things you're passionate about. But cliques form when we welcome people in relationally based on those things or we exclude them because of those things, not because of Jesus Christ, but because of, of, of a, a common horizontal earthly connection we have with them and you know, we welcome them in there, but not, but not because of Christ. That is not a church. That is a club. We are not a club. We are, as Paul said to the... Ephesian elders, we are obtained by his blood. The church was bought by the blood of Christ. It is a place where relationships are meant to flourish, not because we have secondary things in common, but because we have Christ himself in common, right? That's why we're here, right? Because Christ is our common thread. He is our common hope. He is our common salvation. We, as sinners, we stand on equal footing at the cross, and we lock arms and hold hands with others who are diverse, younger than you, older than you, smarter than you, less educated than you, richer than you, poorer than you. It doesn't matter. It matters in a club. It doesn't matter in the church. Now, here's, here's the deal. It comes down to every one of us, every one of you and every one of, of me. <laughs> It comes down to every one of us as individuals in a corporate body to embrace this and to uphold this and to believe this and to resist the temptation to replace Jesus as the center of our fellowship. Do you hear me on this? It is up to every one of us in this church by the grace of God and the power of God believing in this truth that the church is a place where relationships are meant to flourish it's up to us to resist the temptation to make our fellowship around anything less than Jesus Christ. Now, if you're one of those people who are discouraged right now with your relationships in this body, here's what I would ask for you to do. My, here's my counsel. First is to pray. To pray. You know, we had a great seminar this weekend, the Praying Life Seminar. Filled us with faith to pray. To take your loneliness to God you know, there's someone who can do something about it. That's God. So take it to him. Pray. Let him satisfy you with, his, with the truth of his goodness. And ask him to provide a friend. Or ask him to provide a relationship that connects, that you connect with. Ask him to fill you in that. But here's the second thing. If that's, if that's you, the second thing is maybe don't think as much about how you can find a beloved brother to you or a beloved sister to you, but how you can become a beloved brother or a beloved sister to others. You know, you may not be able to control what other people do for you, 
but motivated by the Spirit of God, you can pour yourself out to become a beloved brother or sister in this body to many. And I've seen it happen. And it's a wonderful thing. So the church is the place where, the, where relationships are meant to flourish and then second. The church is where the fruit of the gospel flourishes. The church is where the fruit of the gospel flourishes. The church is the place where people should come and be able to say, what you say, Christians, about this God, it's true because I look at the church. It's the evidence of the truthfulness of the gospel. So Paul, as he writes these closing words in verse 23 and 24, he pronounces this this benedictory prayer over the church. It is command, it's exhortation, it's prayer. That the church would be distinguishable in its fruits. And what does he say? That the church would have peace, verse 23. Peace be to the brothers. The church would have love, a faith-filled love. The church would have grace, that grace would be with all who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, love, grace. So the church that is distinguishable by the gospel should have this fruit being born in its life. It should bear the abundant fruit of peace, love, and grace. That's what the gospel ought to do in our lives as a church. You know, one of the one of the best sessions at the conference that I, that I attended was taught by Ray Ortland. He's a pastor in Tennessee. He was the, I guess, the guest speaker for this conference. And he did a breakout session with just the men. And he taught a message out of 2 Corinthians 1 that I think resonates with this section of scripture for me. When he said that gospel doctrine should shape gospel culture. Our doctrine ought to shape our culture. And I think that Paul has this in mind too, that peace, love, and grace are all the the outworkings of the doctrines he's taught us as a church to treasure. He's saying, you believe these things are true, now may they be present in the lives of the people. May, May people experience out of you peace, love, and grace. And so I thought to myself, if we, and I'm picking up on something that, that, that Ortland said at the conference, but if we preach that as, as Zoe and Caden so, so well put as they recited the scriptures, if we preach that he himself is our peace and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, if we preach that Jesus Christ is our peace and that he has brought those far and near together as one man and to make peace, if we preach that, but then people walk into our church and experience a church of grudge holders and complainers, those who are restless and unsatisfied, we are unsane by our culture what we have preached with our mouths. Do you get that? We're we're, we're teaching in our doctrine and we're teaching in our culture. So love, if we preach that that a faith-driven love is ours in Christ apart from works because of what Christ has done for us, but then people come into our church and they see a people who don't care for each other, they don't love each other, they don't reach out to others, They don't try to get to know anybody. They don't make space in their lives for relationships. They don't come alongside those that are hurting and those that are broken. Well, we can preach all we want that God is love and that he has poured out his love upon us abundantly. But what people are going to get is is that we don't love. We unsay what we are saying in the gospel. And grace. If we get all worked up about grace, this idea that that undeserved sinners can receive favor and merit from God, favor and blessing from God, apart from our own merit. We can't earn it. It solely rests on the work of Christ alone. If we get so excited about grace that we even name our church, Grace Church, and then people walk into the church and they experience from us not graciousness, but they experience judgment and law trackers. You broke the law just there. 
and they experience from us self-righteousness and they experience judgment over heart motives and actions and they experience those who are puffed up because you know their church our church is not like church a b or c or we as people we're not like those people over there x y and z you know they're The name might say Grace Church, but what they're experiencing is Law Church. And that is not a good church to be at. Gospel culture should flow from doctrine. And Ray Ortland said this well, and I agree with him. He said, gospel culture will overshadow gospel doctrine in the long run. Because what you say has to make its way out into our lives. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. Well, we know we're hypocrites anyway. That's that's part and parcel of the gospel. But the transforming power of the gospel should begin to transform us to where the fruit of the gospel is evident in the life of the church. And I look at this and I think, may God make grace church. And you uphold your own part in this. A church that is a church of peace. Not a peace because we'd always get along and because we always agree on every point. A peace because Jesus Christ himself is our peace. And so we work hard to reconcile offenses. We work hard to not carry grudges. We work hard to not simply complain, but to be proactive to serve. That we would have peace. And that Grace Church would be a church filled with love. That those who come into the church would would know that it's okay to be a sinner in this church. You know what I'm saying? I want our church to be a church that is so loving, not compromising on the gospel, but actually as an expression of the gospel, that God so loved the world, the sinful world, that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Could we not have a posture towards our community and towards our world and towards those who come in the doors of Grace Church with this kind of gospel-infused love that says it's okay for you to be a sinner here? God's going to change you. (laughs) But it's okay for you to come. We love you. Could we do that? Could we be a church that's filled with grace? Filled with grace, not just in name, but in practice. Because we have experienced the lavish grace of God. Your sins, if you are in Christ, are forgiven. Because God is gracious. Should that not shape the way that we interact with each other? So Paul's words through Tychicus to the church become our words to us. Peace be to the brothers. Where where are you lacking peace right now? Where is there peace that's, that's been broken in relationships in the body? We'll go back and reread Ephesians 4. And then reconcile. Where are you lacking love? Or where are you lacking faith? We'll go back to Ephesians 2 and read about what God did for us in Christ, giving us the gift of faith to work it out in, his, in good works that he's prepared for us. And where are we lacking grace? May we be a culture that welcomes sinners that comes through our door. Because everyone who comes to this door needs Jesus Christ just as much as you do today. This is the brilliance of the church. This is the brilliance of the church that God is is purchased with his blood. When I started off the series, and I'm closing, when I started off the series, I held up this Lego creation that my son had made and talked about how the church is a little bit like a Lego creation and how God takes various diverse pieces of colors and shapes and sizes and functions and puts them all together in a a creation of art that far surpasses anything that the world has seen. Greater than Van Gogh, greater than a Picasso. This work of art which is the church, this is the mission of God to send his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross, to be resurrected from the dead, to give hope to sinners by the power of the Holy Spirit, to draw them together as one for the praise of his glory and his grace, both now and forevermore as we worship our Savior in heaven. This is what God is doing, and this is the brilliance of the church. There is no other organization on planet Earth like the church. 
And if you get up close and personal to it and you look at the individual parts and pieces, they don't look all that impressive. They just look like a little piece of plastic. But the church in its radiance and its glory and its splendor, when you stand back and see what God is doing, makes being a part of the church worth it. So I pray that God would infuse into your hearts and increase in your hearts a love for each other, a love for what God's doing in this body, a love for the mission that we're called to together. I hope he's doing that in your life. If he's not doing that in your life, come talk to me because I want to I re-preach this to you. I want to pray for you. I want to inspire you that we wouldn't just waste our lives, but we as a church would give our lives for Christ. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we are needy and helpless and broken and sorrowful sinners who are saved by grace and who as a church have this mission now inspired by your spirit to bring the gospel of redemption and reconciliation into all the world, into every sphere of our lives so that nothing is off limits. Lord, I pray you would help us to have this heart I pray with these words of Ephesians that you would protect our body from division, that there be peace, that you protect our body from apathy, that you would give us love for each other that moves us into action with faith. And I pray, God, that you would make us a gracious people who welcome sinners so that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.